evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. It's an honor to be here. We are Team Sunny. I'm Sarah. This is Jen, Tanner, and Christina. Our proposal unlocks the natural symbiosis between Connecticut Green Bank and Inclusive Prosperity Capital. Connecticut Green Bank has the history and reputation to prove innovative concepts, while IPC has the latitude to take them and spread them out of Connecticut and across the country. For IPC, we are recommending Sunny Certification, a program that will train contractors and allow IPC to unify the clean energy movement. For CGB, we're recommending the Electric Vehicle Investment Program, or EVIP, E-V-I-P. It will facilitate the purchase of electric vehicles, electric buses for schools, and push progress in Connecticut reducing carbon emissions, saving schools money, creating jobs, and earning a 10.4% IRR. So let's start by meeting Sunny. This is Sunny right here. <laughs> Don't you love him? <laughs> Sunny is fun and memorable, a lighthearted icon to bring serious solutions. Sunny's certification is built out of CGB's existing eligibility criteria and is similar to like a trusted choice for insurance agents. It says, I'm trusted, I'm reliable. So Sunny's certification proves reputation, it's careful training, and it's a promise to be a mentor in the clean energy movement. Together, Sunny and Sunny certification make IPC a intermediary for all stakeholders. To charitable funders, they say your dollars will have certain impact. For implementers, the contractors themselves, they help to build business through Sunny's broad appeal and reach low and middle income communities with IPC's financing. For community organizations, they, they amplify the visibility of projects and allow them to inform their constituents of what's happening and what they might be able to do to get involved in the movement. And finally, because Sunny is so sticky, he has the pull marketing effect of bringing individuals into the movement. I'm now going to hand it over to Christina, who will walk you through IPC's expansion strategy. Thank you, Sarah. We learned in the case that IPC carries a liability of newness. They have fantastic programs, CGB's trusted financial instruments. They are now challenged to scale them across state lines. The diffusion of innovation theory tells us this is possible. The theory offers five factors which influence adoption of innovation. IPC's financial instruments address many of them, and with the addition of SUNY and SUNY certification, they can address them all. For the first, relative advantage, an IPC loan for a solar panel is better than a high electricity bill. For the second, compatibil compatibility, SUNY offers mass appeal and is thus relatable to the experiences, values, and needs of low and middle income community members. To the third, complexity, Sunny contractors recognize how complex clean energy financing can be, and they mentor individuals through the decision-making process. The fourth one is tough. One can't install a solar panel today and uninstall next week, but Sunny certified contractors, through their words and the Sunny logo on their hard hats, prove the viability and value of an IPC loan. Last but not least, observability. Lower bills say it all. Lower bills are a tangible outcome and which prove the value of an IPC load. Here, we've suggested that Sunny can help increase adoption of IPC's loans, but how will they scale? We recommend that IPC respond to the interest in community solar expressed by Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island, as described in IPC's business plan in the case. To do so, they will of course need additional charitable funding from the Kresge and other foundations so they can train their first cohort of Sunny certified contractors. This will include IPC's trusted Connecticut contractors, but also the developers from these five states. Once certified, the developers can then take the IPC products and effectively scale them across state lines. I will now turn it over to Jen to tell you more about our recommendations for CGB. Thanks, Christina. We believe that electric vehicles coupled with group modernization will lower the carbon footprint for Connecticut. We believe this because in December, in this Building a Low Carbon Future for Connecticut paper, the state government highlighted that the transportation and electric power, electricity power generation sectors make up almost 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions for the state. These are the target areas for the government and 
Um, so that's that's why we're we're recommending our electric vehicles and the modernisation. So grid modernisation is in line with the electricity power segment and electricity elect, sorry electric vehicles go to the transportation sector. For example, one electric bus is the equivalent of removing five cars from the road uh, or 23 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. So just to repeat, that's one electric bus is the same as removing five cars from the road. So our recommendation is that CGV finance the transition of Connecticut school buses to electric using a vehicle to grid or V2G arrangement. Other states are already transitioning their buses to electric. And Connecticut's schools are now due for an upgrade. So the highest barrier that remains for this uh, rollout is a cost differential between a diesel bus and an electric school bus. So an electric school bus is $260,000 that has vehicle to grid capacities compared to $110,000 for a diesel bus. We have found that this is something that can be overcome through a vehicle to grid arrangement and Tanner will go over these details now. <clears throat> Thanks Jen. So CGB will help overcome the cost barrier by offering a long term low interest rate loan which schools will then be able to repay through the cost savings they'll see from operating an electric bus compared to a standard diesel bus. CGB will then receive the return necessary to make this an attractive investment through the revenues from vehicle to grid. Once the initial batch of loans has been created, they can leverage their experience in securitization to gain the funds necessary to expand the program throughout the rest of the state and eventually onto CT Transit. So for the vehicle to grid revenue, we looked at a paper, a very widely referenced uh, research paper at the University of Delaware, which focused on um, vehicle-to-grid capable school buses. Uh, this, is, uh, this is referenced in Massachusetts' recently implemented school bus program as well. It's one of the few papers that focuses on school bus specific vehicle-to-grid revenues. Uh, and the paper found that one school bus could generate up to $15,000 in revenue a year. If you combine that with the $260,000 cost that Jen mentioned earlier, and the $20,700 loan payment, we can see an internal rate of return above, of above 10%. We can even reduce uh, Delaware's vehicle to grid revenue assumption by 50% and still see a return of over 6%. On the other hand, schools will have the, 20, uh, the lower than $21,000 loan payment that they'll be responsible for, which they'll be able to more than cover with the savings from mileage, maintenance, and fuel costs. Schools will end up saving more than they'll be responsible for paying. So we've covered the economic benefits, but there are also significant environmental and societal benefits as well. For example, it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve the efficiency of Connecticut's grid, and also improve the skills of Connecticut bus operators. So in conclusion, we believe that EVIP will be a proof of concept, just as CGB was for green banks, that will spread economic, environmental, and societal benefits to the nation, while IPC will work symbiotically to fuel and accelerate systematic change for a greener future. Thank you again so much for your time. Uh, we have a few appendices to help us answer any questions, and we would love to take those from you now. Thank you, T.W. Questions? Um, I'll okay, please start it off, just No, uh, okay, great. Um, my question's gonna come on uh, the sunny certification, but I did want to observe, I love the idea of kind of the vehicle to grid revenue and throwing that in and kind of using that as a as a yield enhancer. So, so kudos to you for, for that kind of uh, out of the box thinking. Um, on the sunny certification, which I, I like sunny, I like sunny. Uh, but uh, what thought did you give to some of the, the liabilities that are associated or the risks associated with the certification and an expectation for delivery upon you know, what Sunny represents? That's a great question. Um, so for clarity, are you that, that Sunny represents solar energy specifically and not other energies, or is there something else that you see them representing? Either it could be either solar, it could be energy efficiency, but you know, with coming with Sunny is an expectation for delivery of 
performance of services or whatever. So, yes. and if those expectations aren't met, then you know they're great. Great, I'm with you. Um, so yes, of course, Sunny and Sunny certification. We we expect that those come with that expectation. Um, it is that that we believe will propel the increased adoption um, and kind of build build this energy and synergy in the movement. Um, and so, what if the expectations aren't met? I think Christina and I can can answer that for you. Um, I would say one is that we did. We did think carefully about like what the, the process would be that we would build out beyond CGB's existing eligibility. And specifically, I think the training as a mentor is where we feel like this certification can stand out. Uh, so the idea behind it is that we want the contractors to be the face of the movement and IPC to be sort of pushing and giving them the resources kind of behind the scenes. Um, so in that way, like careful training in both, both the financial instruments as well as like needing to prove your competence as a technician. Uh, we talked through a number of different criteria that they would need to meet before they would be eligible to have this, including like proof of several jobs, resumes of staff, interviews, um, things of that nature that like are both on a competence level and a relationship level. And I would add, Sarah, that we saw on CGB's website that they currently, uh, that CGB <laughs> currently um, gives out the Pace Setter Award every year. And so we took this to, we assumed that contractors really were executing well as reliable partners and could be trusted both with the financials and the technical side. And so um, we applied the same assumption to Sonny. We view him as kind of a version 2.0, if, if we may, to the Pace Setter and similar certification programs which currently exist. Um, I have two questions, um, but thank you for a great presentation. Um, first is about the um, installers and the value they get from the certification. It sounds as if one value you think is out there is if they just get more business, but you know, are there other values for them and why would they want to be in this program? And then um, the second question is really about uh, you know, the size and scope, and scope of this, particularly as it relates to the electric buses. And you know, I don't know if you're aware, but 169 towns in Connecticut they all manage their own budgets around schools and school buses. And so how would you propose getting all of them on board with making such a, a big change and one that is uh, potentially a little more expensive, even though I think you tried to offset some of the added costs? Yeah. So should we address, Christina and I will address your question around the installers and, and Sunday first uh, and what's in it for them. And then Jenny Tanner can address the question of the 139 towns. 169, yeah. 169 pounds. <laughs> yeah, so how, um, do you want to talk? Sure, I can, okay. I can start. So um, I think we really saw the value for contractors in, of course, growing their business, but just in our kind of literature review of solar installation companies, um, it looked like there was a lot of pride behind the work that they do to move clean energy forward. And so it's really just this feeling of being a part of a, of a bigger movement, as well as additional training. So as they're... Uh, receiving training from CGB and IPC on these financial instruments, that's enhancing their skill set as well, which they can apply to their own businesses and maybe future work in the future. So I think it's kind of a, a professional development opportunity, opportunity to be part of something greater and something good, and of course just everyone needs to grow their business to stay, to survive. So um, those three values, I would, I would say. Thank you. For the buses? Yeah. Um, in our research, we found that the Board of Education in Connecticut has shown interest in um, going electric, uh, and as a part of that, he's been looking. They've been looking into the um, feasibility of doing so. So, having having the Board of Education on board will um, so part of the um, <laughs> will help to facilitate that, I would imagine, and also like from a supply perspective, uh, it can't all happen at the same time because the supply isn't there immediately, so it would happen uh, as a rollout across uh, where the need is. Yes. Oh, yeah. Young's my wife. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's unusual. <laughs> uh, there was mention um, in the case itself about the income disparity in communities in Connecticut. And so, um, with regard to that last question, um, 
and the gradual rollout. Uh, how would you envision managing, if it can be managed, equality among very poor communities in Connecticut and very wealthy communities in Connecticut where spending twice as much for the school bus might not matter at all, and in the poor communities it might be a huge hurdle to Great question. Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, I, I think we, we first acknowledge that you're absolutely right that that is a huge challenge and that disparity certainly exists. Um, I think our interpretation of this and understanding is that this is a great thing and somebody should bring this to life and we think CGB is, is the organization to do that. Um, in part because of the history and, and you would obviously know much better than we do, but believing that this quasi-governmental organization has figured out how to work with politicians at various levels and community stakeholders and with both affluent and poor communities so that they would be very well positioned to do this. Um, and then in terms of mitigating that specifically, maybe you could talk to the numbers. Yeah, so to help the core schools um, for the buses, we think that the, the low interest rate loan will help them out and that the cost savings they'll see will make it so that they'll actually, uh, they they won't end up spending any more money than they currently are on diesel buses. Um, we also have, we did a sensitivity analysis and found that we could offer a 0% interest rate loan as well. Um, so there's, with with the with the original figures of the um, full vehicle to grid and the 1.5% loan, uh, we think there's enough margin to be able to have some flexibility with maybe the um, lower income schools. So it's also my marriage, you're about to go from the supply. <laughs> so this is a real energy nerd question. Uh, in your economics, did you look at frequency regulation? And do you know what frequency regulation is? Sanders going to take that question. Yeah, so, so this was kind of, that number is uh, takes into, into account frequency regulation. Um, from the frequency regulator, which in Connecticut is ISO New England. Um, so, you know, it's, it's different in Delaware, but in Connecticut it's, it's ISO New England, and they actually have a paper as well that uh, compared their figures to the paper's figures as well, and they ranged from lower to much higher, but um, we, we did consider frequency regulation and looked, looked at Connecticut specifically. Because the economics of frequency regulation is free money, uh, and I don't know what the Delaware data is, but you guys become a perfect frequency regulator for wind power. Um, frequency regulator are payments that people receive by taking power off the grid when the grid is producing too much power, primarily at night and heavily, uh, and it's just a, uh, it's like money in the is there. Right, I think, and so uh, FERC actually, Federal Energy Regulation Committee, uh, released um, released some guidelines back in 2010 or 11 which actually made um, energy regulation more profitable for batteries specifically because batteries can respond so much quicker to the grid's requirements whereas like wind or any other power generation can take anywhere up to 10 minutes where battery is instant and can discharge and take in uh, energy immediately. So it's definitely um, the biggest energy regu uh, regulator. Time for one more question. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.